coming up on Doc Type, it's time to figure out what's really important with your website. Then, cookies. We'll tell you how to store information on your web pages. Mmm. So pile on the curry powder and don't forget the naan. It's time for Doc Type. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by Colab and GoDaddy. I'm Allison House. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer who thinks JavaScript is a decaf latte, or a developer who can't tell his margin from his padding, Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you the emperor of the interwebs. Now, you may have noticed I'm not Nick Pettit. I'm afraid Nick's out with a case of the handsomes, but I'll be here to walk you through the spooky forest of design. We're really excited to have Allison hosting for us this week, but you know what this means? I've been in more episodes of Doctype than Nick. Count, Count it. it! Anyway, Allison's going to be talking about designing for content, and I'll be showing you a little something about cookies. Let's check it out. You may have heard the phrase, if everything is important, nothing is important. As a designer, it's vital to be opinionated about what content matters, then use that to establish a visual hierarchy. To decide which items on a web page are important, we have to assess their value. We do this by considering our audience's primary tasks on the website. Ask yourself, why is a user on this screen? What do they want to do? The content associated with those tasks has the highest value. Let's say we've been asked to create a blog. The content is a title, navigation, blog posts, calls to action, and a few items we often see in sidebars. To organize this content, we can assign a low value to items that aren't essential in helping the user achieve their primary goals, like these sidebar items. Keep in mind that every extraneous bit of information competes with important, relevant content. If you have an item that's nice to have but seldom used, consider eliminating it. After assessing your content in the context of the user's experience, you should have a clear picture of what's important and what's not. Once you've determined the importance of your content, create a visual hierarchy to direct the user's attention. This boils down to grouping relevant bits of information, then emphasizing your most valuable content and de-emphasizing the less important stuff. The elements and principles of design are the key to establishing a visual hierarchy. If you give two pieces of information the same visual style, you're saying that they're equally important. Smashing Magazine features a lot of content on its website, but does a good job of differentiating it using shape, proportion, and color. Most visitors are seeking blog posts, so each blog post title is larger than any other text on the site. Calls to action are clarified with the use of color, orange for the RSS feed, and blue for Twitter. Proximity and shape group like items. Finally, the less important stuff is smaller in size and lighter in color. Up next, Jim's going to whet our appetite with cookies. Hmm. If you're in Orlando and you're watching this show, you need to be at Colab Orlando. Located in the heart of downtown, Colab Orlando has become a magnet for creative thinkers and entrepreneurs, like you and me. If you're just stopping by for the day, or if you're starting the next big thing, Colab has you covered. With affordable office space, high-speed internet, and a great environment built for collaboration, Colab is the best place to co-work. Even we work there now. And if you're not in Orlando, be sure to check out the new Colab space that just opened up in downtown Nashville. If you want to become a member of Colab, or if you're just curious, be sure to check them out at CollabUSA.com. If you want to remember any sort of information on your websites, cookies are the way to do it. We're going to take a look at what cookies are and how to use them in JavaScript. The web was designed as a stateless system, meaning that no information is stored or maintained between page loads. This system made a lot of sense in the early days when it was all about loading documents. But once we started wanting to build more complex websites that allow us to log in and do things, we needed a way to remember information between pages. Cookies are the web's answer to that problem. Cookies allow us to store small amounts of information in the web browser, and the browser will make that information available to the server and the browser when loading the site. This allows us to remember which Facebook user the browser is logged into, or what the last item you viewed was, or any other piece of information needed to make a site function. When setting a cookie, we assign a string to the document.cookie property. Now this string has a very specific format. First, we set the name and the value of the cookie. Now we can store multiple pieces of information, each assigned to a unique cookie name. We say our cookie's name, then equals, then the value of our cookie. 
Then we place a semicolon and we say expires equals, and we pass a date in this format. Finally, we place another semicolon and give it a path. This allows us to restrict the cookie to certain directories on our site. Typically, we just put a single slash to indicate that the whole site can use the cookie. Now this can be really inconvenient to do over and over again, so let's create a function to make it easier. We will call it setCookie, and it will take a name, value, and optionally an expiration length in days. If we omit the expires clause from our cookie string, the cookie expires as soon as the user closes the browser. In our function, we first check if our expiration in days argument is set. If so, we create a date object and set its date to the correct time in the future. We do this by adding the current time in milliseconds to the number of milliseconds in the number of days passed to the function. So we multiply our argument by 24 hours in the day, times 60 minutes in the hour, times 60 seconds in the minute, times the 1000 milliseconds in a second. We then create our expires clause by calling dot two GMT string on this new date. If the date was omitted, we simply leave it blank. Finally, we create our cookie string by joining the name, value, expires, and path info, and assign it to document.cookie. So now we can set a cookie, but it's no good to us if we can't read its value. Let's take a look at how to do that. When we inspect our document.cookie, we don't get back the same string that we assign to document.cookie. Instead, we get something like this. Each key and value separated by an equal sign, and each pair separated by a semicolon. If we want to get a specific value, we have to do a little work. So let's create a getCookie function. First, we check to see that document.cookie exists, and that it's not empty. We then split the cookie into an array where each argument is a string with the key and value of one of our cookies. To do this, we call split on the string document.cookie to tell it to split on the semicolon character. Then we need to loop through each of our cookies with a for loop. You can learn more about the for loop in episode 25 entitled Iterators. Since the browser places a space after the semicolons, our cookie string may have a space preceding the actual name of the cookie. We can remove it with this regular expression replacement that replaces all of the leading white space with nothing, thereby removing it. Finally, we want to check if the cookie in our loop is the one we're looking for. So we compare our desired cookie name plus an equal sign to the first part of our cookie string. If it matches, then we can extract the latter half of the cookie, the value, and return it. Now the browser will encode certain characters, so you want to call decode URI component on it to clean it up. If we make it through the loop of all cookies and we don't find a value, we then return null. Now that's just one example of how to read and write cookies. There are many other ways to do it, and we'll link to some examples in the show notes. Additionally, if you're working with a library like jQuery, MooTools, or Prototype, there may be plugins available or built-in functionality that makes working with cookies a lot easier. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you gonna go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctype.tv from? So we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you gonna use? Enter the code Doctype3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com that's it for doc type be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doc type and follow us on twitter at doc type tv and if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of doc type send us an email at questions at doc type tv if you subscribe via itunes or rss you'll never miss another episode so until next tuesday remember that every great web page starts with doc type